Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Jones coming at you through your Chromebooks. Today we're going to talk about debugging. So debugging is probably not a new term to most of you guys, it's just the process of identifying or removing errors from either hardware or software. And if that's the case, then programming is the process of putting them into the hardware or software. But this part's probably new. So there's two types of errors or two types of bugs that can show up. There's syntax errors and there's semantic errors. Syntax errors are a little bit easier to pick out because they are ones that completely mess up the program. And so when you get an error in your code, that would be a syntax error. You can also think of these like grammatical mistakes. So if you get instructions that are written on a piece of paper and you can't understand what they're trying to say, that would be an example of a syntax error too. Semantic errors, on the other hand, though, are a little bit trickier to find. And that's because the code will look right and everything will fit together. You won't get any errors on the screen, but it's written in a way that the computer cannot understand it or it doesn't understand it the way you intend it to be understood. So remember that all code is just ones and zeros, but we can't understand ones and zeros. We have a hard time writing code in strictly ones and zeros. So instead, we have different programming languages. The programming language that we are using is App Inventor. App Inventor then has certain syntax rules. Those syntax rules kind of describe how it is that you communicate with the computer. When syntax errors occur, App Inventor can pick them out because it knows how things are supposed to be written, how things are supposed to be instructed. And so in that case, you will get errors that show up on the screen. So for example, this code right here shows a little error right there. Uh, you also find this in the bottom corner, which will tell you how many errors and how many warnings you have in your code. So when you see one like this, you can actually click on it and it will show you what the error is or give you kind of a hint on what needs to be fixed. So in this case, it says select a valid item in the item dropdown. And so what that means is start X was never declared or start X doesn't fit in this particular procedure. It's used in a different procedure. Another way that App Inventor picks out syntax errors is by not allowing certain blocks to snap together. So you can see in this little example right here that it has X, Y, and R. R is radius. And so whoever the user is tried to put five in there because they wanted a radius of five but this block won't snap in there, so they won't actually click. you probably come across this before. And that's because the syntax is looking for a numerical value, not a alphanumeric value. So syntax errors are a little bit easier to pick out just because they're usually found by the compiler. And so the program, whether it's App Inventor or Java or C++, any of those, typically your compiler can pick out syntax errors for you. You sometimes have to figure out what it is that's wrong with your syntax, but you at least know where the problem lies. So a semantic error is when you follow all the syntax rules, but the program doesn't do what the program intended it to do. So these are usually trickier because they don't pop up an error, everything might look fine to you, but the computer is translated indifferently or it can't translate it at all. Remember that computers follow exactly what you tell them to do and they don't have any room for interpretation. They can't kind of fill in the gaps that you put into the code. So for example, if I were to come to your house and say, hey, can I have some water? You would probably go in the cabinet, you would get a glass, you would fill it with water, you would bring it to me. But if you say to a computer, hey, can I get some water? It's probably going to spray you. You wind up soaked because it can't fill in the gaps. It doesn't translate that as, oh, he's probably thirsty. I'll go to the cabinet, get a glass, fill it with water, bring it back to him. So that's a semantic error because the syntax rules were followed. You gave a command, the command was understandable, but semantically you didn't follow through with directions. So here's an example of semantic error in App Inventor. So you can see from this, there's no errors on it. This would work, this would function, but it wouldn't do what the programmer intended because you see right here, when red button is clicked, it'll set the paint color to blue. So more than likely, what the programmer wanted was that when the red button was clicked, it would change the paint color to red. So this code would function, it just would not do what you wanted it to do. So here's another example of code that would work. It just wouldn't do what you wanted it to do. This was uh, a number counted from 1 to 10, or it wanted to go for 10 steps. And so if you look right here, it says numbers go from 1 to 10, and each time they decrease by negative 1. So if you're starting at 1 and decreasing by negative 1, what this is going to do is go down to 0, then negative 1, then negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and it would never reach positive 10. So again, semantic error, it would do something, it just wouldn't do what the programmer intended. The way you would fix this bug then would be to change the from to 10 and the 2 to 1. That way it goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So we've been in this class for a while, so you guys have gotten some experience with debugging. So a lot of these things are probably familiar to you. But here's just some tips for debugging, especially semantic errors. 
So try and change only one thing at a time and then test it. You know, as long as you're through the Wi-Fi, connected through the Wi-Fi, you should be able to change things and then test it out. Don't wait all the way until the end after you've made a whole bunch of changes to test it out because then you're going to have to go back to every single one of those changes. Remember what every single change was and use that then to find out what the errors are. So it's a lot easier if you just check it after each time you make a change, especially significant changes, and then test early. So when you start programming your app, don't get all the way through to the end and then test it. Start testing right at the beginning. And you can also add comments to your code. I'll show you in the next slide how that's done. And then simplify your code with procedures. So the process of abstracting is important because it not only saves room in your program, but it also makes it a lot easier to find your errors. If you've got a whole bunch of code that follows a bunch of repeat, repetitive steps, if you make one simple mistake in any of those steps, it'll throw off the entire thing. But if you simplify it with a procedure, if you abstract it with a procedure, it's going to make it a lot easier to pick out those bugs. You can also display variable values and labels. What I mean by that is, let's say you're writing a program where you've got an object that's moving faster and faster and faster. Now obviously you're going to have something in the code that declares the speed as a certain value, and you're watching your program you don't think it's moving faster like it's supposed to. So you can add a little text box on your uh, program somewhere, so when you're watching it, it shows you what the value of the speed is, and that's just for doing the debugging. So then you can see, all right, hey, it's not going up by as much as I intended, or it's not going up at all. And then once you actually publish the code, or once you publish the program, you would take that out of there so the user wouldn't have to see it. And then, of course, showing it to someone else. So finding someone in the class that can take a look over your code. A lot of times it's me if I'm there. But you can also show it to any of your classmates. They probably do a better job of debugging than I would. Or there's places like the forum online where you can display your code for someone else to go through. Because a lot of times you know what it's supposed to do, and so you think it's correct. But if you have someone else look at it and they read through it, and they say, well, no, according to this, it's going to do something different. Different set of eyes usually helps. It's a lot better than just banging your head against the computer. So adding comments, this is really good, especially when you have giant programs with lots of different things. And in a class like this where we're coming in every other day, so you might spend a class period going through doing a whole bunch of stuff, and then you come back you know, on Monday after you've been gone for three days, and you take a look at it and it's like, ah, I don't remember what that was supposed to do. What if you just leave yourself a quick comment, kind of reminds you what each step is supposed to uh, do. And then also when you share that code with someone else to take a look at, they can read it and see what it is that you were supposed to do with that. So where did the term debugging come from? Well, it literally came from a bug. Navy Rear Admiral Grace Hopper was working on the Harvard Mark I experimental computer. This was in 1945, and they literally found a two-inch moth somewhere inside of the computer that was causing a problem. And so from then on, when anything went wrong, they always said it probably had bugs in it, and it just stuck. So that's it. Today you are going to practice debugging. You're going to find an example of the Pong game. That has a couple bugs in it. You are going to find them, and you are going to write about them on your portfolios. And none of the bugs that you are looking for are going to be moths. Or any other living animals, for that matter.